Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, uh, let's learn about the EU, all right? My name's Connor, if you're new, hope everyone's doing well. I had seen the NATO summary on a map from Geohistory, and it was really good. Let's learn about the EU. The story begins at the end of World War II, as the European continent lies devastated, leaving the United States and the USSR as the two major world powers. Their growing rivalry marks the beginning of the Cold War. While the Soviets control Eastern Europe, the West looks to the US for reconstruction aid. While the old continent is found divided by the Iron Curtain, in the West, the idea of European unity begins to take hold. On the 9th of May 1950, France, via its foreign minister Robert Schumann, proposes a Franco-German reconciliation and placing under a common high authority the production of coal and steel, the main wealth of industrialized countries, which is also needed for the manufacture of weapons. The aim is to boost the economy and maintain peace, with the project left open to countries wishing to join. Shows you how much uh, Western Europe feared the Soviet Union. Um, the fact that after the second war, giant war between Britain and France and uh what, 20 years or 25 years? Um, and now they're just immediately like, hey, let's let's patch this up. Let's go. Join the following year with the project left open to countries wishing to join. The following year in Paris, six countries sign a treaty establishing the European coal and oh, hold on, I think I missed out. Hold on. for the manufacture of weapons. The aim is to boost the economy and maintain peace, with the project left open to countries wishing to join. The following year in Paris, six countries sign a treaty establishing the European coal and steel community. As Germany is divided by the Iron Curtain, only West Germany becomes part of it. To accelerate the development of Europe, the six founding countries meet on the 25th of March 1957 in Rome to sign two new treaties. The first treaty creates the European Economic Community, whose main objective is to establish a common market, including allowing the free movement of workers and eliminating tariffs between member states. The treaty also defines common policies on transport, trade and agriculture. The Common Agricultural Policy, among other goals, aims to increase agricultural productivity, offer reasonable prices, and ensure a fair standard of living for farmers. The second treaty... It's only in 1957. Now imagine, so 15 years, no, 12 years? Imagine the biggest conflict in human history, tens of millions of deaths, and happening in... 2012 and and now we're we're you know working so hard for this you know more unified economic and military uh you know alliance that's establish and ensure a fair standard of living for farmers the second treaty establishes the European Atomic Energy Community, coordinating civilian nuclear research programs. The treaties of Rome enter into force in 1958, but it would take several years for its policies to be implemented. Many countries asked to join the communities, including the United Kingdom, but France, under the leadership of Charles de Gaulle, vetoes the accession request, considering the UK as too close of an ally to the United States. Makes sense, honestly. The institutions of the three communities well, are I don't, know if it, I don't know if it makes sense if that's justified, but I, I, as I said in um, a few videos ago, I forget, forget what it was. I uh, It was a video on France. I, I don't blame, you know, that. I don't... I don't hold that kind of concept against them. You know, I, I wouldn't want to just be ruled... Uh, by the USA. I don't know if it's warranted to to kind of veto Britain into getting involved because you think they're close enough to the US. Maybe that's a little too far, but I do understand the the main part of the rationale. I you know. to 
the institutions of the three communities are merged to enable more efficient functioning. There is now a single commission composed of commissioners chosen by the heads of state. Its role is to propose European laws in the common interest of its members. There is the council made up of ministers of the member states and whose role it is to approve, modify or reject the proposals of the commission. There uh, hold on. I, 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 uh, hold on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Institutions of the three communities are merged to enable more efficient functioning. There is now a single commission composed of commissioners chosen ally. Yeah. The institutions fast forward if you want. of the three communities are merged to enable more efficient functioning. There is now a single commission composed of commissioners chosen by the heads of state. Its role is to propose European laws in the common interest of its members. There is the council made up of ministers of the member states and whose role it is to approve, modify or reject the proposals of the commission. There is the parliament representing the people of Europe and which also gives its opinion on commission proposals. So before the the parliament part comes in, so this kind of feels like the uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate in the U.S. or the uh, uh, House of Commons and the House of Lords in the U.K. with, uh, it seems like the commission is more the House of Representatives and Commons and uh prove modify made up of ministers what's this called in the again? common interest of the head members there is the council and the council seems like the senate or the house of lords that doesn't really suggest the bills but it has to kind of go through them and go back and forth before you know they, they agree on it and it can pass made up of ministers of the member states and whose role it is to approve modify or reject the proposals of the commission there is the parliament representing the people of Europe and which also gives its opinion on commission proposals. Its power would increase over forthcoming treaties. Finally, there is a court of... Yeah, it seems kind of redundant. Um... So, so the commission, so this is where you propose the bill. This is where it's it's checked and agreed upon by a separate group of people. And then this is sort of the parliament where you're not directly involved in the law process, but you're there to give your opinions on it. Its power would increase over forthcoming treaties. Finally, there is a court of justice that rules over the legality of decisions taken. In 1967, the United Kingdom renews its request for membership, which France opposes a second time. With the removal of tariffs for industrial and agricultural products and the free movement of workers, the economic situation improves rapidly, prompting a new wave of membership applications. This time, negotiations go well. But in Norway, the population opposes the country's accession in a referendum. In 1973, Ireland, the United Kingdom and Denmark joined the community. In Paris, the heads of state and government come to an agreement to create the European Council. Leaders would meet at least three times a year to together define the broad guidelines of the community. South of the continent, after the end of dictatorships in Portugal, Greece and Spain, the three countries request membership of the community. In 1979, for the first time... Hold on the European Council. Leaders would meet at least three times a year to together define the broad guidelines of the community. So far, it honestly seems like these three are the only ones that really matter, and the Council and the Parliament are just sort of uh, redundancies, maybe necessary redundancies, but nonetheless redundant. Is that, is that, is that, can anyone kind of explain what power does the parliament have other than just is it just a place where everyone can kind of air, air their ideas who are who are elected to the parliament or do they have any actual control other other than just a little inf influence from 
discussions happening in the parliament. South of the continent, after the end of dictatorships in Portugal, Greece and Spain, the three countries request membership of the community. In 1979, for the first time, members of the European Parliament are elected by universal suffrage. In 1981, Greece joins the community, while the following year, Greenland, which receives more autonomy from Denmark, chooses to leave the community after a referendum. In 1984, the United Kingdom under Margaret Thatcher says it does not benefit enough from the common agricultural policy, which then represented 80% of EU spending. The United Kingdom under Margaret Thatcher says it does not benefit enough from the common agricultural policy, which then represented 80% of EU spending. The country negotiates to obtain a reduction in its contribution to the community's budget. In 1986, Spain and Portugal join the community. Twelve member states and the European Commission give a boost to... I mean, I have no idea if that's warranted or not. You know, it, uh, of course, you need to talk about any grievances you have and and say you might do something if if it's not so i've i don't know if that's warranted or not but i mean you have the right to to say that if you think you're being you're not getting out of it as much as you think you deserve There's nothing wrong to the with that. community's budget in 1986 spain and portugal joined the community 12 member states and the European Commission give a boost to the internal market by signing the Single European Act. In addition to eliminating custom fees, the goal is to remove all obstacles to the free movement of people, goods, capital and services. It is the single market project to be completed by 1993. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, Germany is reunified. In the East, the USSR can no longer contain revolts and collapses, opening up new horizons for the community, which establishes contacts with the countries of Eastern Europe. On 7th of February 1992, European heads of state signed the Maastricht Treaty. The European Union is created and gets new powers. The treaty envisages an economic union and the future creation of a common European currency. All countries ratify the treaty, including Denmark, where two referendums and negotiations to be exempted from the common currency are required. A new wave of countries hey, that's when I'm born. request membership to the Union, but Switzerland and then Norway oppose potential candidacy via referendums. On the other hand, in Austria, Sweden and Finland, negotiations succeed and in 1995, the EU grows to 15 members. Schengen area, I forget what this means. Signed in Schengen Luxembourg the in 1985, zone. the Schengen Agreement is gradually introduced from 1995. Its objective is to abolish border controls and therefore have total freedom of movement within the European Union. The agreement is incorporated into the European Union through the Treaty of Amsterdam. So is the Schengen area, it's just the, the area within the EU that is most connected and in, 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 in all of its uh is the most unified in the in the most in most aspects like currency economic things freedom of travel in addition the common currency project advances which would be called the euro however the united kingdom sweden and denmark do not want it the remaining member countries set up the european central bank the euro was officially launched on the market in 1999, although the currency would be put into circulation only from the 1st of January 2002. As negotiations take place to enlarge the union, heads of state meet in Nice to try and improve the structure of the union. I feel like if I had a, a large, stable currency, I, I might want to keep that too, because that's, that, that's some kind of individual power that you hold and and why like, give that up the outcome of the meet in nice to try and improve the structure of the union the outcome of the treaty of nice is considered mixed two referendums are needed in ireland for it to come into force 
On the 1st of May 2004, 10 new countries are included in the European Union. All new members join the Schengen area with the exception of Cyprus as part of the island is controlled by the Turkish army since 1974. After the half failure of the Treaty of Nice, the 25 heads of state meet in Rome to again try to streamline the functioning of the European Union. This time, they aim to create a constitutional treaty that would replace all existing treaties with a single text. This sparks heated debate across Europe. Fearing an overly powerful European Union at the expense of national sovereignty, the French and Dutch populations oppose the treaty via referendums. This triggers a period of reflection and in-depth consultation within member states. On January 1, 2007, Romania and Bulgaria joined the European Union. The same year, 27 heads of state signed the Treaty of Lisbon, which aims to strengthen and improve the functioning of the EU after enlargement. Notably, it is agreed that the EU's role is to promote peace, support sustainable development, fight against social exclusion and discrimination, and safeguard cultural heritage. The treaty is ratified by all states but Ireland, which holds a referendum and rejects it. Yet again, more negotiations and a second referendum would be needed in Ireland for it to take effect. The global economic and financial crisis has repercussions on the Eurozone, which enters a recession. After the rout of major European banks, many countries find themselves in difficulty. In particular, Greece, part of whose public debt has been kept hidden with the help of consultants from the Goldman Sachs Bank. The country is forced to ask for financial aid from the Eurozone and the IMF, in exchange for which it must implement austerity measures. Ireland, coming to the aid of its banks, also sees its public debt explode. But the country does not want to ask for aid from the Eurozone, fearing it may in return be forced to raise its low corporate tax rates. The country finally receives aid all the same, in exchange for which it must adopt a strict plan. Subsequently... That's why Ireland is super powerful. Um, and again, if any of these... Uh, if any of these like decline referendums or, you know, the UK uh, or like countries like wanting to keep their own currency or the UK, uh, do the thing with the farmer thing in the 80s, if anyone gets like frustrated with that, then like you, you sh why are you even thinking about an EU? The, the, anyone who wants who would get frustrated at anyone doing referendums or whatever, they, this is a very new concept still. And, you know, you're a very diverse continent. And I think referendums and disagreements are really healthy. If it were too streamlined, I would think it's only inevitable for it to collapse in some way because there's no way that all of you can agree on everything. So I think these are, are completely healthy and um, shouldn't be seen as like, oh, why can't they just agree on this and get it through? Portugal, Greece a second time, Spain strict plan. Subsequently, came in exchange for which it must adopt a strict plan. Subsequently, Portugal, Greece a second time, Spain and then Cyprus obtains financial aid from the Eurozone, while almost everywhere on the continent, austerity plans are put into place. In 2013, Croatia joins the European Union. At the borders of the continent, the so-called Arab Spring creates instability in many countries. The civil war in Syria, a second civil war in Libya and in Iraq, and other events such as the war in Afghanistan and violence in the Horn of Africa push many people to migrate to Europe. Despite the construction of walls at the Turkish border, in 2015, over a million migrants enter the Schengen area. Europe tries to slow the flow of migration. Security patrols are reinforced on the Mediterranean Sea, while certain countries temporarily reintroduce controls at their borders. In addition, the European Union signs agreements with Turkey and then with Libya, where the political situation is very unstable, so that they control and block the so-called illegal migration routes in exchange for financial aid. Migrant processing centers are funded, mainly in Italy and Greece, where migrants find themselves awaiting regularization in overcrowded conditions. The migration crisis divides European... Doesn't that give incentive for them to just push migrants through? 
you're like, all right, we need more money. It just seems like you're you're paying countries for something that they should kind of already control. Um, in overcrowded conditions, yeah. the migrant themselves processing centers are funded mainly in Italy and Greece, where migrants find themselves awaiting regularization in overcrowded conditions. The migration crisis divides European countries and fuels the rise of nationalist and Eurosceptic parties. In June 2016, the United Kingdom, through a referendum, votes in favour of leaving the European Union. The country then enters long and difficult negotiations with the European Union to define the conditions of their withdrawal. After numerous failures, an agreement for Brexit is finally reached and the United Kingdom exits the EU on January 31, 2020. While the UK no longer has any decision-making power in the bloc, it continues to contribute to the European budget and receive funding at least until the end of the year. By this deadline, it is meant to negotiate future agreements with the EU, in particular concerning customs duties, free movement, the status of Europeans living in the United Kingdom and vice versa, and the status of the border that separates Ireland from Northern Ireland. One of the really enjoyable things about politics as I learn more is that it's all very, it's complicated in a way of solving things. But the problems themselves that arise are very, very simple and I feel like are very similar to how, you know, neighboring houses react or, or neighboring you know, or even individuals react. It just, it, I don't know. I, I don't know why I imagined it to be much more complicated, but it's very sort of basic concepts. It's just trying to get solutions to them and all of getting in the weeds that obviously it gets a bit more complicated. After the departure of the United Kingdom, the European Union has 27 member states with a population of about 450 million. Negotiations are underway for the accession of new countries, mostly in the Balkans. Negotiations for Turkey's accession, which started in 2005, are stalled. 19 countries are members of the Eurozone, while six other countries have adopted the Euro without being a member of the Eurozone or the EU. Finally, the Schengen area now comprises 26 states, including four non-members of the European Union. That's cool. So you can go from like northern Norway to, to Lisbon, Portugal, and not need a passport or anything? With Cyprus, just go. Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania expected to integrate soon. Romania seems like it has a bright future. Really cool. I uh, love this channel, Geo History. Fantastic channel. Great video. I uh, would appreciate any comments, guys, as always. And I uh, hope you're doing well. And hopefully I'll see you guys next video. Bye, guys.